Here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Media Club. Um, I'm Michael from uh, the American University of Paris. Um, there's going to be Sam, actually, Yanti, and myself. We're going to run today's Media Club. And we had chosen like one, uh, I believe, like a very interesting article by um, Dana Boyd. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And um, we had actually like a couple of people like choosing this uh, keynote that she presented at the SXSY EDU, EDU conference. Uh, I think there was like at least like 10 people saying they would like to discuss this uh, keynote. And what, can you actually pronounce it well, uh, Sam, the title? Because I'm What have <laughs> we wrought? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've never seen that before. And um, so we want to discuss this article because we believe that she's at the moment uh, one very dominant or very pre present person in the media landscape discussion and the media literacy discussion. And first, I'm going to do like maybe a little introduction to her. I'm going to say who she is. And I think then, if I remember correctly, Samantha, we're going to start right away like in small groups or maybe in just to get like some first reactions and then we're going to report back. Is that right? Uh, yes. Sorry. I'm distracted by <laughs> email. All here. watching out like for everything. So who is Dana Boyd? Dana Boyd, she is actually a, uh, she's um, the founder and the president of Data and Society, which is a research institute in the United States. She is also like uh, one of the main researchers or principal researchers at Microsoft Research since 2013. And she's also teaching at the New York University and her focus is uh, mostly on society and technology and how this intertwines. She has published a couple of books actually where she, she's reporting out back, uh, from her studies about uh, youth culture and technology. Mostly one important book right here to mention is It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network at Tween Teens. And another one that it's entitled Participatory Culture in a Networked Area. Um, I think she's a very dominant person. Uh, actually, when I, she's a very punchy lady when I heard her in her keynote, which I really liked. Um, it reflects probably also like her 26 pages of uh, CV that I found online. <laughs> and um, I think she definitely has something to say. Um, she comes out of different traditions. She, I think she studied social um, computer sciences at the Brown University, moved on to MIT, and then to the fashion school in Berkeley. So I'm looking really looking forward to, to have that keynote discussion, especially there was also many, many comments and discussion then afterwards also, including Rene and Mahabali, uh, res responding basically to Dana's keynote speech. And um, so I hope that everybody had some time to, to watch that one. It was like 45 minutes of um, keynote and then Q and A's. And um, I think we're in, right now, how many are we? Sam, we are nine, 10, probably maybe just like um, jump into small breakout rooms, like th in groups of three or four. What do you think, Sam? And then uh, yeah. have like a little think, pair, share activity, and then come back and report out by group about the first reactions on the keynote. And um, except if somebody wants to speak up before we kind of do that? Yeah, maybe, um, can, uh, so I think a couple of people haven't um, been able to listen to it. So maybe we can give just a brief overview of um, some of the points that she made. Mm, sure, do you want to go ahead on that or do you? Yeah, um, so I'll try my best and um, if somebody else wants to jump in, um, go for it because I'm still monitoring emails. <laughs> Um, getting people into the meeting. But basically, um, so the whole idea was that um, Dana is saying uh, that, um, sorry, I'm going to um, I think we have like a little dog at the background. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn okay. off my sound. 
That's okay. Um, oh, let me mute. Where's my mute? Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Usually I'm able to do that, <laughs> but I've lost. <laughs> I I'm like that effect. I'm, I'm just watching for one of you to have a little kid running in the background, you know, dancing around and everything. I like that effect. I can, I can imagine that the dog was so excited about the keynote, so you want to speak up as well. So that was <laughs> okay. So basically, so the point that she's making is that um, we've all been up in arms about what to do about fake news and misinformation and how this has suddenly come to the forefront of of problems, especially in the United States right now. And so she's saying that um, a, lot of, um, a lot of educators and even legislators are talking a lot about media literacy as a solution to kind of fighting the effects of misinformation and disinformation. And um, she's arguing that critical thinking education is not actually, in the way that we deliver it as media literacy educators, is not actually the solution because the problem is more um, maybe psychological um, than what media education can kind of uh, address. So um, she's saying that there, she had four points and I don't think I wrote them down correctly, but basically that there is a, like an epistemological warfare going on um, around the construction of knowledge and how, you know, we're learning about things today. Um, and even that the idea of learning is under attack. Um, she's also saying that um, there's a weaponization of critical thinking. So um, we're telling people to question things and they end up questioning kind of everything and they become more cynical than um, skeptical. Um, she also talks a lot about power relationships and um, who do we trust. Um, people are already kind of weary of media and news in particular. Um, and so in using media as a way of like fact checking is not really effective. Um, and so she's basically saying that media literacy is just not enough and that we need to include more psychological concepts. And I think coming off of Daniel Kahneman's book, the last two, uh, the last two months is like a really interesting way to kind of come into this, to this conversation. So that was a really, really vague overview, um, but hopefully that's enough to get us all um, kind of started about like some of our reactions about the problem of you know, disinformation and um, how we think media literacy can or can't address the issue. What do you guys think? Good, sounds good to me. I think it's also very interesting that at the end she's proposing these cognitive strengthening uh, exercises. So it's like there's three of them. And so that she's actually proposing like to the, in a way like media literacy crisis, teaching, pedagogy, like these kind of exercises in order to respond like to everything that's misinformation or fake news or like this in general context. So that was, and then that was also like, uh, well, I'm not, I'm gonna stop right here. I think we wanna collect first like a couple of um, of thoughts and then share out like in, a, in the, after the breakout sessions. Okay, so I'm gonna split us up into, why don't we do threes and then there'll be a, gr a couple of groups with extra people. Cool. And maybe like to just like to have some framing questions, maybe just like for the, it should really like first reactions on the, the keynote. What do you, where did you agree? Where did you disagree? Um, of course, what is missing? What can be criticized? Um, and um, yeah, so these are like a couple of questions to keep in mind. Okay, here we go. Here we go.
Oh, April, you made it. <laughs> oh, yay. I don't know what was the issue, but thank you. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I think what the issue was is initially I sent out the incorrect information for Zoom. And then when I sent around the correction, I think, um, yeah, it didn't take. <laughs> So. Okay, well, thank you. Your image is is flashing all over my screen. <laughs> oh, okay. And is it in a way that it's supposed to or no? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's it's rather like uh, flash, flash, flash. Oh, um, well, we're experiencing a lot of new things today. <laughs> Oh, well, anyhow, I can ignore that. I can just make this smaller. In any case, hi, okay. everyone. <laughs> Okay, so everyone's just broken out into um, breakout groups, and Kate, it looks like you're back. Did you get bumped, or? I see Kate. Yeah, sorry, my microphone wasn't working, so I had to restart. Is it working now? I see yeah. you. <laughs> I know it. you can't hear me. Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Oh, okay, great. So yeah, I was in break. I think I was in breakout room two. I'm sorry, but I my microphone for some reason wasn't working. So uh, okay. Um, so I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's one of those days. Um, so I can try and put you back in there if you'd like, or we can just kind of start over the three of us. That's fine. That's fine too, as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, did you? Okay, so April, you just joined. So we just kind of did, all you missed is that we just kind of did like a very, very surface level overview of um, <clears throat> who Dana Boyd is and what this talk was all about. And okay. um, it sounded like you um, had a, like thoughts already. So you wanna, so basically we're just doing a quick breakout to just share initial reactions and thoughts about um, what she talked <clears throat> about. So Kate, you want to start? I, I'm excited too about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed her talk. I thought it was fairly spot on. Um, I feel like there's been, um, I come from more of an international background, uh, international development background, and there's a lot of talk in our field about knowledge, attitude, behavior. And I think um, that just, for example, like just because you know smoking's bad for you doesn't mean you change your behavior. And I think in terms of fake news, I think everyone's been really good about changing everyone's attitude about um, being being cautious and aware of fake news. And um, and then unfortunately, we haven't given people the knowledge tools. And so all it does is create this kind of system of distrust in which no one knows what to believe anymore. And um, I think it's really had deleterious effects on how everyone is kind of viewing what is real and what is fake. And then of course, um, messages coming from power and people of authority kind of saying that everything is fake news does certainly doesn't help that um, that conversation to kind of really be able to more um, take a more nuanced approach like how we uh, really come to understand like what is truth so yep. hi uh, so really quickly I want to say hi to Mary who's just joined us hi <laughs> hello <laughs> So we're just in small um, breakout groups, sharing our initial reactions to what have we brought. So um, Kate just shared, and then um, April, do you wanna go ahead? Um, I was fascinated with a couple of things. I loved her phrase, epistemological warfare, because that is truly what I'm seeing happening, and I'm not even sure how to do battle. And uh, one of my notes with a big question mark was she talks about forms of critical thinking we've um, introduced are backfiring right now. And I would love to have a chance to delve into more of what she might mean by that. Yep. So that's um, all. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mary, do you want to share your initial reactions? Oh, I can't hear oh, Mary. I, yeah, I yeah, I don't think your microphone is working, Mary. <clears throat> I see Mary, but I don't. Oh, oh just lost her. Okay. Uh, well, Mary, jump in when when you can. Um, Okay. Uh, oh, okay. There you are. Can you hear me now? 
Ah, yeah. there. Yes. All right. I'm sorry, I had that Bluetooth speaker on. Um, I just finished reading, uh, listening to her lecture, and I have like four pages of notes. I'm in um, public health, and I am really ignited by what she said. Um, I just wrote a little piece about how public health is no longer viable um, because there's so many issues with trust, with misinformation, and with epistemological view about what public health is and how we're trying to control people and injecting things that are unknown into people's bodies like the flu shot and vaccinations and how that particular way of looking at the government intent is actually beginning to cost more than just um, you know, the demise of critical thinking or the, the shift of critical thinking is actually costing people, you know, health issues in their bodies. So I was completely like, I have been saying kind of a similar thing for a while. And I was so glad to hear um, this lecture. I think she's um, really on to something um, that's really important in many fields. <laughs> I agree. And so I, <laughs> I also wrote down quite a few notes um, as I was um, listening. And I actually started to, I started to make a separate note about feelings because I had a lot of like emotional reactions to mm -hmm. what she was saying, partly because a lot of what she was saying are things that I'm challenged with when I talk about media literacy. Um, people challenge me with some of these um, questions like um, how to change values or behavior. Um, and I don't really have the answer, which is really uncomfortable. Um, and um, yeah, I also, I, I feel you, April, on the epistemological warfare thing. Like she definitely, I think, put that in a very, um, I don't know, a very real way that, um, yeah, I don't know, that got to me um, also. But the biggest thing I think um, she talked and she didn't touch on this much, but um, one thing that I've experienced that she did talk about was how um, policymakers talk about media literacy and they talk about the need for it and platforms do the same thing. I've been in meetings with platforms with, um, who send representatives to say like, oh, we want to talk about news literacy and how we can, you know, incorporate literacy education into fighting this problem. And none of them actually know what it is. So the meeting ends up being about like nothing except for explaining the same problems that we have with no solutions. Mm -hmm. So that part, I, I kind of wish that she went more into that, um, especially because she's in the room with so many of these people so often. Um, and I, I kind of agree with some of the, the criticism of her talk that she doesn't really actually go into media literacy very much or the pedagogy or like, you know, how it's taught or what it teaches. Um, that's not to say that I disagree with her criticisms, but I just don't think she goes in depth enough. And I wonder if that's a reflection of um, where she comes from in the tech world, you know, amongst people who also talk about media literacy and don't quite understand it. So. Yeah. She also didn't have enough time to really go into enough depth, I think, because totally. She was mostly, I think, being a bee under our bonnets, which in that she was very successful, I think. Yeah. I've got a bee. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think she meant more to critique the critique and say, what is, what is the outcome of, of critique? Mm -hmm. You know, that it can be used in many ways that it was not intended to be used, which is what's happening now, of course. Um, but also that I really loved what she said about uh, mental health and the suicide hotline that she works on. I think that's that's really essential uh -huh. to have those kinds of things be part of the conversation instead of just epistemology, but like, you know, look at <clears throat> things like outcomes. Um, you know, what is the outcome of this critique? When you, when you teach students to critique, which we probably have all been doing for years, you know, what is the outcome? They're left with a lot of of like, you know, standing there with their mouth agape, not knowing what to believe or mm -hmm. who to believe. Yeah. Um, and I think that is something that we really, <clears throat> in every field, particularly in my field, need to address. Like, yeah. you know, she admittedly said that part of that was not in her 
um, in her talk, and she sort of apologized for it. But I think we really are in a moment of intense destabilization where we've got to find places, even one single place, where we can kind of connect um, out, both inside and outside um, digital media. Um, or we really are um, you know, beginning to change in ways that were completely unintended and unexpected. Yeah, um, I, oh, sorry. Also, hi, Pam. And Renee's back with us too now. Um, and, and I think there's also this, uh, I was just reading a, something about this attitude of contempt that is so pervasive and has taken over the dialogue where um, difficult to, to, ha to ha have civility as we, as we explore some of these epistemological differences and uh, so that we can discuss the, the, what justifies our beliefs and, and try and find a path forward. Trying to find something I just uh, read about that. Yeah, and even yeah. to justify our actions, you know, mm -hmm. to take it a, 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 a little step beyond belief, but to justify the actions of, you know, like the president putting out hateful tweets or people hating him, like with such a vengeance. I find my own kids, like, I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> It seems like there's a way that this has been fueled, you know, intentionally um, by critique, which is like kind of mind blowing to me. <laughs> or by bots, which is even worse. Yeah. 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 So I'm not so persuaded by uh, Boyd's argument that the asking questions is the problem. I think it certainly, you know, we keep. At RT more, you know, I, it's a it's a reasonable state to make, but I don't actually think that's a problem. Um, I wish that uh, Dana engaged more with a big idea that came out of the library world when the ARL developed its information literacy. Yeah, is authority is constructed and contextual. I think the epistemological crisis that Boyd describes well, right, is the idea that um, we are coming to value experience over authority because authorities hire a lot of people out. Authority and the authority. Renee, for oh, you losing her. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, she went away. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, um, I think Renee's point of the experience versus authority is really it's quite true. Really I, I keep thinking about how even the language of science traditionally has this kind of inherent language of skepticism involved where we speak of hypotheses and theories and kind of have this like kind of openness to new information. And yet in this day and age, like we have to drop some of that language because it kind of invites the door that um, because people take personal experience and assume that that is from the, from the personal perspective, our news is kind of from our personal perspective and like kind of filtered through our social media feeds and kind of extremely personalized. And so then people kind of take personal experiences over what scientific data, which looks at a larger picture would, would allow us to view, which not to say that we shouldn't be looking at some of these individual experiences, but we need to put them kind of in the place of a larger picture in order to really be able to understand a, full, a fuller scheme of what's going on. And so, yeah, I mean, I just think there's, um, it's just really hard to find that balance of how do we open the door to kind of inviting in some of this healthy skepticism, but without going into that like full on level of like cynicism of everything not being um, credible. Uh, I think we also go back to the uh, a, a crux that is 
where we start to relate experience to opinion, and then there's the argument that, well, everyone's opinion is it, uh, it deserves an opinion, but not all opinions are arrived at by a logical deductive process, and some are very faulty. Uh, therefore, not all opinions are created equal. And so we need to somehow find some sort of ground zero, because I feel like we're playing in the sand without a, a, a common definition of what is a well-founded opinion, uh, i.e. experience. That's a great uh, uh, note to end on, April, <laughs> for this round of breakout session. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome back again. So the idea is maybe right now to just like uh, share out like what we discussed like a little bit, like the different uh, things we talked about. I'm not sure is there like any group who wants to go first? Anybody? Feel free. I mean, yeah, I guess we can just jump in. Uh, sure. So it was me and, and Gina and uh, we had uh, Kate initially, but then she she went away. So uh, so we, yeah, so we discussed. Um, and, and Gina, please correct me if I'm if I'm missing something. Well, basically, we talked about uh, you, you know um, how uh, Dana Boyd. Um, uh, talks about different definitions of media literacy and that, uh, you know, so people have different experiences of media literacy. So it's kind of understandable that, uh, um, you know, some experience, some people who have one experience then can misinterpret when people, when somebody else comes with different experience. And maybe that's what April was actually saying because we, when we jumped into the session, she was finishing. So it sounded really interesting. And now I want to know what, what you were talking about, April. Um, so, and uh, so, and how it is, it was interesting what she wrote about epistemology and the, the challenges of knowledge. Um, so our, I guess our opinion was sort of like, there were some, uh, you know, maybe drawbacks to her argument because it was very provocative, but also some interesting thoughts to, to discuss. I don't know if I miss something, please, Gina, please add to my summary. No, I think you said it beautifully. Thanks. Anyone else like to share? Yeah, maybe can I, Sam, I can speak up. Go for it. Here we go. I think like in our discussion, we also talked about the epistemologies like a little bit. We had that discussion in a way as it's like an important aspect like in uh, Dana Boyd's um, keynote. At the same time, you see, we said as well that we are, as I'm coming out of library sciences, um, so maybe we're not like the best to talk about epistemologies, you see. I think maybe it's more like part of the f philosophical discipline. And in a way, um, when you connect it then to the uh, cognitive strengthening exercises that Dana, she's actually proposing on an individual level. So in a way, if we are not sure about how to teach it, maybe we should then maybe reach out to the philosophy um, and maybe have that actually pulled in to that in the classroom, you see. Knowing that we also had the question, is that enough like the cognitive strengthening exercises? Um, you said right here as well that, um, that they're maybe not enough because it's like on an individual level. Donna, she got criticized a lot on her missing out of the tech companies. So we had like discussions on that part. We also talked about media literacy. Um, it was attacked right here, basically, kind of, we felt that it was kind of harsh but without uh, maybe going too much into details, saying like, in, so because it's happening somehow in the United States, but it would be interesting to see a bit more right here. Knowing that in a keynote speech, maybe there's not enough time to do so. And we looked also like we had a little discussion about the, the students actually as well, like because it's the question of how to make them think, the critical thinking aspect which basically in Dana's uh, keynote was somehow also like criticized that it can backfire. And we, you just, yeah, we just said that uh, many times students are more like strategic learners and less about like the deep understanding 
of and that there might be a kind of a conflict or a kind of a a clash right here actually so the i think and feel free uh alida and um and Tong Yan, if you want to add something right here because there was the three of us talking i think you covered it really well thanks okay thank you anybody else who wants to shout so i i'll share something and i i don't i didn't get around to saying this um i did touch about about um this was a very sort of emotional thing for me to watch like as i was listening i i noticed a lot of like kind of a range of emotions that i was going through from like frustration to hopelessness to <laughs> anger <laughs> to hopelessness again but um also kind of a fear like as you know i'm i'm just now becoming an educator and these are really really tough things to tackle and i'm actually teaching literacy classes now like news literacy and um and media literacy and i find myself um when i approach certain topics i get really nervous like when we start talking about truth and evidence like i know that when i go down that path about talking about like you know questioning authority and um you know uh how authority and knowledge is constructed it's going to eventually go to um well what is truth anyway and like very philosophical things that i i don't feel prepared to really lead a conversation about in a way that is going to grow healthy you know healthy um critical thinking instead of just cynicism. So I would love to hear if any of you have experience, um, you know, teaching these kinds of things in a way that feels successful or not. Um, and I'm happy to share both, <laughs> both for my end too. But yeah, this was, this was very emotional for me, actually. I wonder if anyone else had the same. I'd like to share something that I did that was <clears throat> successful and it was in high school, uh, high school freshmen. So they were like 14 year olds, 15 year olds, a very, very young class, you know, like emotionally, like they're like, you know, 12. And um, we used these very kind of incendiary, like controversial memes and analyzed them. So one was the NRA um, video, like the clenched fist of truth, um another was an anti-vax meme and another was i think was something about oh yeah with the colin kaepernick like nike ad um and we had done a series of activities and projects that you know help students analyze them using the five key questions of media literacy like you know why was it made what was it made for and um you know, what was the viewpoint of the person who made it? And we were able, instead of like, in my um, district is extremely liberal and the people who are conservative feel um, silenced and afraid, like they can't speak because they're going to be um, ridiculed and people won't like them. And like, they wanna be able to be conservative and have people like them. Um, so, I forget which one. Oh, I think it was, I forget which one it was, but having these um, like talking points, like for analysis enabled students who were like in training to become, cause they have like these junior like police training programs and junior military programs that like some of our students are part of, but they would ne they don't ever have a forum to talk about it. I mean, it's okay to go to like the Naval Academy, like that's cool, but it's not cool to want to be a policeman. Um, it's not cool to want a gun, you know, it's not cool to believe in having a gun and having these discussions, like talking about the viewpoints actually helped students to speak up and share their background about why they think something about something and it forced like the liberal students who are always in the you know majority in my district to sit back and listen and give them respect and it was amazing like i've never been in a room with adults who were able to do that so that was just these you know very very um simple five questions of media literacy that you know were, were the key that opened the door to civil discourse 
so, so if I understand right, so the students actually had the, or the high school students had the chance to speak also then to adults to see like different perspectives, different epistemologies. They were listening to, to, their, they were listening to their own perspectives to each other. Mm. Well, I, can, can I ask a, a question just to, you know, sort of like make it more problematic on its face is, is, and you can pick your issue, but just the Vaxxer thing is kind of easier to talk about in a way, but how does, how does one be fair to the expression of a point of view that's based on, um, you know, that's very, it's held with a lot of conviction, but it's based on nothing. It's based on not evidence. It's been, I, I have sort of like my own way of thinking about how to address that issue, but I'm curious from the rest of you, is there an obligation to have a civil conversation? You can, and you can go to the Nazi thing if you want, because that's, but that's very extreme. But when you're dealing with an issue where you're, where people hold something very dear that's really irrational, what's the obligation that we have? Um, I I want to, to jump in and first I was wanted to uh, respond to a, a, a Alida a, Adida I'm sorry Alida, I'm Alida. Um, and say that uh, thank you so much it sounds like a really great experience. Um, I think that there might have been some magic ingredient there also that maybe like the specific personalities of students or the way you facilitated it. Because I feel like, I mean, the five critical questions can produce very difficult, with very different uh, reactions, right? They can produce, uh, you know, clashes and people would say like, I think that and another person say, well, I think this and, you know, go like, far away with your opinion, uh, right? So, so maybe something about you as an, as an educator that you were able to facilitate it. And, uh, uh, and I think this is something that we still need to, to, to try to discover, like this magic ingredient. I think and, the magic ingredient, I think the magic ingredient is respect. And I think that ties together with Ralph's point. So Ralph said, how can we respect the anti-vaxxers? Uh, so Alita showed respect to her students across a wide range of ideological logical spectrum. She knew that they were working out their ideas. She respected that process. And Ralph says, how can we respect people, these people who don't use what we think evidence is, right? And so I go back to how, you know, People, so it's kind of like a little bit of the values crisis that we have from not allowing a space for values to be, to exist in our classrooms, right? Because I make decisions about a lot of things based on evidence and reasoning and also based on emotion and also based on my values. And my values, my ideology, though the evidence I use to support my values are rooted in my faith, right? And I feel like it's important for me to respect the fact that my students have faith in the magical things of the unknown. <laughs> now that might be Christ died on the cross and was resurrected. It might be there were golden tablets that were dug up in New York state and taken out to Salt Lake city. And it might be that autism is caused by vaccines. These are, these are matters of faith and respecting people's faith is part of the process of having a civil society. It, I yeah I I wanted just to jump in and uh, I I also wanted to say something to to Ralph and now to to Renee as well because uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge that you know what we think science is with it's it's event eventually like deep inside it is also faith right because we can see we can say like we believe that anti -vax vaxxers are like wrong right uh, but how do we know that? We usually say, well, we believe, you know, because there is a scientific consensus, right? But how do we know? Like, how do we trust scientific consensus? And if we, if we look like in the history, we can see examples when scientific consensus was completely off. Right, and it changed like when people said like uh, racism is like actually fine because people are different and they have different like brains and stuff and you know and homosexuality was like considered a, 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 
abnormality to like very recently, right? And scientific consensus is like, there are many other examples that the now scientific consensus is fluctuating about some stuff. So, and we cannot say that we have really read every single paper about, and you know, vaccination and stuff and did like recent, you know, so we believe eventually we believe, right? So, and this is something that I thought this is like, I was fascinated by Dana Boyd's argument that she brought this up and said like, so how do we address that? Like, because we come to class and say, you know, uh, these are opinions that, that are right because, you know, experts, but we believe in experts and then there come students that believe in different things. So what we should respect them, and, but where does that lead us? So brain like blown, <laughs> mind blown. So that's that was my my thinking. <laughs> so if I can just jump in to answer the uh, question about the Boston incident, um, for me, uh, there was a there was a now um, you know I don't remember when it was revealed that the pro uh, um, abortion and the anti-abortion factions uh, got together secretly. Um, to create a conversation out of the public eye after there was a shooting at an abortion clinic in um, Boston, in the Boston area. And, at, and what they revealed when after like, I don't know, what was it, Renee, 5, 10, 15 years of their continued meetings was that neither side had convinced the other of their point of view, but now they babysat each other's kids. And my feeling was, isn't that like one of the best things that we can get to if we don't if we don't come in thinking that we have to change someone's mind but that we can recognize their humanity and respect their values and their point of view then that's a success in my point of view can i can you hear me Okay, so um, I think part of this is understanding what our own biases are. And when we come into the classroom or we interact with someone who we don't agree with, that we need to acknowledge that we could be wrong. And we have to come from that position because if we don't, then we're not open. We're not able to hear our students and we're not able to present it in a way that might encourage them to have some deeper thinking. So our job is not to make somebody change their mind, right? It's to encourage them on how they might have a different frame. We want to provide them those aha moments where they can, we can lead them gently down another way of thinking. Because I, I think one of the things that Dana was talking about, and she didn't label it as such, but our cognitive heuristics, how we process the world, how we see the world. And when we come to media literacy education, we come with our own cognitive heuristics, our own way of seeing and framing. And if we don't acknowledge that up front, if we don't know ourselves well enough to know that, I don't know how we can be fully effective in the classroom. Uh, get it, just, just jump in real quick. Uh, oh, sorry, Renee, you, wanted, you also saying something, but you were muted. Okay, I just say, uh, I totally like agree with the, the point about biases. This is something that uh, I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, but I was, it was interesting how you said like, how do we understand these things in order to be effective and, and maybe we need to like gently lead them to like an other way of thinking. But this is again, this is like a question that it leads, it remains unanswered. Do we need to lead them to another way of thinking? Or is it what Pam suggested? It's not about trying to lead each other to a different way of thinking because that's a never ending clash, but about just recognizing each other's humanity and, uh, and maybe we are babysitting each other's kids, you know, even if we have different opinions, like radical different opinions about stuff, you know, we have actually achieved what we, what we wanted to achieve. 
I don't know. If I, if I can just, um, so uh, yes, I think we do have a responsibility to provide a framework for another to understand where we're coming from, because without that framework, they don't understand how we arrived at a particular location. So we can gently provide another way of seeing the world. That doesn't mean my way of seeing the world is the right way and your way is the wrong way. It's another frame. And I think as educators, we have a responsibility to provide these different paradigms to our students and understand much like a theory, they're like glasses. You put on one pair of glasses, you see the world in a particular way. You put on another pair of glasses, you put it on in another way. But ultimately that decision-making has to come in um, accordance with our own beliefs and values. I'm never going to change what you believe in, in over the course of a semester or over one conversation, but I can provide you a different frame that may be a new way of seeing that you hadn't considered before because we don't know what we don't know. So I really appreciate the fact that we have come to a different, at the end of this session, we've come to a very different place than where Dana came out in her talk, right? So we've, uh, we've talked about um, multi-perspectival thinking. That was Gina's idea about thinking about with multiple different glasses on and helping kids to think multi-perspectively. Um, and we thought about issues of uh, socio-emotional support, respecting people as human beings. To me, the paradoxes of this um, talk are exemplified. And, and I think maybe paradox is probably, this is the age of paradox, right? Uh, but the paradox that just gets me, you know, and I'm here at South by Southwest now, one year after the talk, right? Is that when Dana first published this article, she published it with the clickbait headline, did media literacy backfire? And I feel like, um, and she did that because that, that's how you get attention, right? So what we have right now is a society where there's too many voices, there's too many points of view, it's incoherent. And the way you get attention is you use conflict, you use, um, you exploit people's curiosity, you blame someone, right? You create a hero and a villain and a victim. So people now are using very incendiary rhetorical strategies because the landscape of communication is so crowded. And so for me, it's, um, that's, it's, it's almost like a little bit of practice what you preach, right? So <laughs> do we have to resort to clickbait? Does she have to make media literacy sound stupid and dumb? in order to build her argument? Did she have to do that? And so I feel like, you know, in some ways, um, we are caught in this paradox. Um, we might not have been talking about this essay if she didn't provoke with activating strong emotion. At the same time, those techniques, doing those techniques keeps in place the systems that further polarize us. What, an, what a paradox. Well said. Uh, well, I, it, okay, just my personal opinion, like when I was reading those pieces, I didn't feel, I didn't think that media literacy is dumb. Like I focused on other things that were really fascinating to me. So that's why I, I'm not as, I guess, worried about this argument. Like I, I agree that to use our, to, to be heard, we need to put like bright pictures and uh, like spot, like words that jump into like people's eyes, uh, right? But um, anyways, it's just my opinion. I was just, I just felt that um, I wasn't, I, 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 didn't, I didn't feel bad about media literacy after reading this. I was just thinking so much about this truth and critical thinking that was like my i still thought that media literacy is really cool and just, just different people have different opinions about it so that's my take it might be because she didn't actually talk very much about media literacy she just kind of like shot at it and kept going <laughs> to make some other really good points um but april uh, april's hand was up i think uh, was that on purpose april i just 
I just wanted to pose a question that Dana Boyd posed at the very beginning, because I, I watched it a couple of times, and I keep coming back to this, uh, as Renee phrased it, a very provoking statement where she said, uh, the forms of critical thinking we've introduced are backfiring right now. And I'm wondering if, if that's part of what we're all circling around here. Well, um, just to drop a little note in, I think part of the problem is that critical thinking has two pretty distinct meanings. One has a lot of political, um, a, a political ethics tied into it, and one doesn't. And in some contexts, what's presented as critical thinking really isn't moored into any kind of a um, um, value system except for the idea of suspending judgment, as opposed to critical thinking that's really digging after, you know, sort of uh, egalitarian treatment of other people. But just that be my. I think that's a key idea, Ralph. I think that the, 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 and, and, and it does reflect the wide range of practices that are out there because we certainly have seen that, right? I've definitely seen a university colleagues who's create little hermetically sealed discussion groups where there are some topics that are totally off limit. There are some truths that cannot be uh, spoken and some points of view that are not welcome. Uh, part of, part of that is, um, rooted in our fundamental disrespect, right, of each other. And so mm, I think, uh, yeah, it, it does invite us to look more closely at our practice. And like Alita said, to like, when it works, to try to understand what, what makes it work, right? So since we're going to learn by failure, most of the time it's not going to work. When it does work, we should try to figure out what's the magic there. Perhaps that's a great note to end on. Although that sucks. It's, it seems like this hour went by so fast. <laughs> this was uh, Michael and um, Michael and um, Samantha, Samantha. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you for voting for this topic for the Digi uh, Club. I think we're gonna go back to the spreadsheet and look at what our titles might be for next month. And then Actually, I also want to invite you go to, your, go to your mailbox and see our exciting new announcement about the seventh annual Summer Institute in Digital Literacy. It's just opened. We've opened registration today. Our keynote speaker is Kristen Zimke uh, from Chicago. And there's a lot of cool new information on the website. If you poke around, you'll get to see all our, our news about how we're growing and how we want to see you in Providence this summer, July 14th through 19th. So come back. And it's a lovely place, yeah. It's a very nice place. Um, so yeah, I'm coming can to I, the I, I just, can I interrupt for just one second? I, I wanted sure. to make a book recommendation. Um, as some of you may know, we've had some uh, racial incidents at OU, at University of Oklahoma. Uh, and we just did a, a, a group discussion over the book White Fragility. Um, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but I'd really, really strongly recommend it. I, I think it'd be interesting for us to discuss it as a group, but I think beyond that, uh, it's a book that is talking directly to a lot of us who think we're not part of the problem and talks about the number of ways in which we kind of contribute to it. So I just wanted to make a recommendation for the book White Fragility. Thanks. Okay. So then, um, yeah, I think we're already over time, but many thanks for everybody for coming, uh, for joining us. Um, I'm looking forward for the next vote and for the next discussion. I'm not sure, Sam, you want to add something? No? No, nope, I'll send an email around just like always. <laughs> As always, so, but then, well then, thank you everybody for coming and for the great discussion. Have a nice one and wherever you are, enjoy. Have a nice one, bye-bye. Bye everyone. Samantha? Samantha? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. Uh, Yonti had a question for you. So. Oh, okay. Uh, Yonti?